There you That's go. <laughs> Uh, uh, thank you for joining uh, the talk. Uh, I'm uh, Itzik Mantin. I'm a lead scientist at Imperva. Uh, in the last 21 years, I've been innovating on security and algorithms and uh, their intersection. Uh, I enjoy the game of uh, analyzing threats and uh, designing mitigation. Uh, I love math and I love all sorts of uh, algorithms. Uh, and I love uh, building security technology. And uh, in my spare time, I love uh, hiking, biking, uh, trail running, and traveling around the world uh, alone or uh, with my family. Uh, this is another one of uh, my hobbies, and I'm, I'm really disappointed that this time I don't have a chance to, to go physically to, to Texas, and I really hope that in the, in the next year we'll uh, uh, meet face-to-face uh, uh, -face and I can uh, enjoy uh, Texas, uh, good uh, Texas steaks. Uh, I will start with a, a brief introduction of AI and uh, the AI threat landscape. I will continue with uh, talking about uh, data poisoning, which is one of the, of the main threats on, uh, on uh, artificial intelligence uh, systems. Uh, then uh, I'll continue with explaining the challenge of data poisoning uh, in the world of uh, uh, web security, uh, how this uh, uh, threat is being um, uh, is, is effective in, the, in, in this area and uh, what are the uh, possible mitigations. Uh, then I will go into uh, uh, explaining uh, about a, a solution to do a robust learning that is uh, uh, safe towards uh, data poisoning uh, on uh, stream data, meaning without uh, keeping all the data and uh, running it in uh, batch processing, uh, which is very important in, in, in many, many applications. And I will end with a summary and conclusions. Uh, we are uh, in the AI era, and uh, no doubt about that. Uh, artificial intelligence is, is everywhere. Uh, it, is, uh, in, it, is, uh, it involves every, probably all, almost every aspect uh, of our life. Uh, and the AI era is uh, also the data era, because data, uh, data the new gold or the new fuel, uh, the thing that, uh, that fuels uh, artificial intelligence system, uh, helps them uh, to, uh, to work and do uh, what they can do. And uh, both the AI era and the data era are responsible. They, they have amazing contribution on, the, on, on many different uh, domains. However, this contribution uh, comes with several caveats, uh, which uh, we usually uh, ignore or at least uh, underestimate to some extent. Uh, and, and, and in this talk, we'll, uh, we'll speak about, uh, about uh, some of these. Uh, most of you are probably familiar with uh, uh, the Gartner hype cycle for uh, new technologies, uh, and uh, I think you can you, you can think about uh, uh, an equivalent a security life cycle uh, for new technologies. Uh, when you have a new technology, and and that was the case for web, that was the case for mobile, that was the case for uh, for uh, IoT. Then at the beginning, uh, people, experts, uh, uh, pioneers develop the technology without too much thinking about uh, security. Uh, they are excited with the, with the new opportunities that are uh, unlocked. Uh, and then at some point, uh, someone discovers that this system, this technology, behaves in, in an odd way when a particular input is being fed to it. Uh, and you have a vulnerability, and then another one, and another one. And at some point, there are so many vulnerabilities that people start asking themselves whether um, this technology can, can, can be ever uh, used uh, in a safe manner. And then we get to this uh, uh, valley, to the, to the bottom, uh, in the point where domain experts and security researchers start to join forces to develop uh, a terminology, to develop a methodology, uh, to give names to attacks, and to uh, start the designing uh, mitigation. And then we get to a stage of uh, a healthy development where uh, the main threats uh, on this technology are understood and are, to some extent, mitigated. Uh, and uh, we get to this sort of a plateau. This is not, not very static because we know in, in security, we, we always have new vulnerabilities and, and new mitigations uh, uh, for them. But, uh, but we get to a, to a stable solution where technology can be used uh, safely. And, uh, and, and AI is, is no different than other technologies in that sense. It has no exemption. Uh, AI also have vulnerabilities. And we'll speak about some of these in the next couple of slides. What you see here uh, is a typical machine learning system, a very, very generic one. Uh, there is uh, training data. So in the training phase, uh, we build a model uh, from a training data or training set. Uh, and this model can be a classification model, regression model, or 
can be other things in, in that depends on the, on the problem we want to solve. Uh, and then uh, this model is, um, is stabilizing, is converging, and once seeing an input data uh, in a phase that is called the inference data, this input data, let's say an image, is now being classified as a cat or a dog. Uh, uh, it's that sort of a, a prediction. Uh, in some cases, then this, this result, the outcome of the model, goes into an evaluation, and, and then this evaluation, whether it was good or bad, is being fed in a feedback loop to, back to the model in order to uh, either to, uh, to enhance it or maybe to just, uh, if the model that we are building is, um, is coming to, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to represent a, a, a dynamic uh, environment, then we want the model to keep uh, uh, to keep uh, uh, being aligned with the uh, with this environment and uh, and continue to uh, to evolve. Uh, when you look at the system from an attacker's perspective, then uh, first you know the when you think of an internal attacker or an external attacker that found his way in using some I don't know some uh, a RCE or any other uh, uh, attack vector. Then, then the sky is the limit. You can do everything. He can tamper with the model. He can steal the model. He can extract data. He can modify uh, every particular uh, decision the model uh, had made. Uh, however, even when the attacker is not an insider, when he's, an, uh, he's, he's working from outside, then still there's plenty of things the attacker uh, can still do. Uh, one of them is a collection of... Um, uh, of attacks called uh, sometimes evasion or adversarial examples or AI deception, uh, where the attacker actually uh, creates data points that uh, confuse, that make the ad algorithm make incorrect mistakes. Most of you probably are familiar, I've, I've seen at least once uh, this uh, example of a stop sign uh, when you add a couple of stickers to it, and then uh, uh, the AI engine of an autonomous uh, uh, vehicle, it looks at this uh, um, and this stop sign, and it looks for him like a speed limit sign, which of course can have a, a devastating uh, consequences. Uh, and in, I think that in every situation where someone tried to create such data points that that uh, that fool the uh, machine learning model, it, it was uh, successful with with very little effort, because we, we are in B science. We know that whenever you build something without thinking about what will happen when the adversary will come. And then the adversary comes, then uh, uh, the adversary's work is, is very easy. Uh, the second uh, 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 threat is uh, training data poisoning. Uh, machine learning uh, uh, models uh, are based on data. Uh, and this data usually, on, on big data, usually it comes uh, from outside, from external sources that are not always uh, uh, trustworthy. Uh, and uh, with, if the attacker has uh, some control uh, over the data, then he can uh, carry out uh, something that is called a data poisoning uh, attack. And we'll speak uh, in, in depth about uh, this, uh, uh, this kind of attack uh, uh, later on. Another slightly more esoteric threat uh, is a training data leakage. When you build a model from training data, then some of the training data is actually leaking into the model, is there implicitly. And in some cases, there are ways to, uh, to extract this data. And if you use the um, sensitive data for the training, which is fairly typical because training is huge. Sometimes it's used with a PII, health records. So it depends exactly on what is the problem that you're trying to solve. Uh, then uh, this is a thread that you should, uh, you should uh, take care of and make sure that you are uh, immune uh, against, that, against it. Uh, but w w as I said, we will we'll zoom into uh, data poisoning. So uh, what is data poisoning and how uh, does it work? Uh, on the left side, you see uh, a typical machine learning model. It is, uh, it is a classifier. Uh, it tries to find the best line that separates between the red triangles and the uh, blue uh, circles. And uh, the, 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 issue, the thing is that if you take a single point, and move it to a different locations, then the, the optimal separator will be completely different. So even if you have, um, if you're changing a very few um, uh, data points, in some cases, it can have significant impact on the, uh, on the model that is going to be generated. And on the right side, you can see uh, a, a more uh, 
significant, severe example where the attacker actually he, uh, tries to do something deliberately and he will put all these, uh, uh, these uh, batch of, uh, of uh, red uh, dots, uh, which will make the model uh, be uh, completely uh, perpendicular to the original model and practically useless for uh, separating uh, the red uh, from, the, uh, from the blue, which is exactly what the attacker was aiming to, uh, to obtain. Uh, now, the, the threat of data poisoning, you know, the terminology, uh, I, I think it is it's fairly new. I only uh, heard about it a couple of years ago. Uh, however, uh, th th this is not a new threat. Uh, data poisoning, um, a threat, I think it is um, almost as old as, as the internet. Because I, I, I'm sure that like myself, when you enter TripAdvisor and you see now you want to, uh, to pick a hotel, and you see a, a positive, a five-star review, then probably like myself, you ask yourself, okay, is this a real review or a fake review? Uh, because uh, TripAdvisor, like many other travel sites or, or actually any site that, that use a rating system, uh, they count on uh, data that is coming from outside and uh, data that's coming from outside, outside it can be subject to, uh, uh, to malicious uh, uh, circumvention. Uh, and this is the case for travel sites. It is the case for um, I don't know for um, film rating sites. It is the case for e-commerce sites. Uh, everything that everything that has a rating system uh, is uh, subject to uh, data poisoning. Uh, and th these sites are aware of that. They do. They take some at least some measures to try to mitigate uh, the threat and, and to uh, to minimize or the to make the life harder for the attackers to, uh, to impact uh, uh, the actual rating. Uh, here you see an example of uh, data poisoning in the wild. Uh, the attack here is a model skewing attack, um, sometimes called uh, also a backdoor. Uh, the attack uh, occurred in the end of uh, 2017 on Gmail's spam filter. Uh, th actually, th this is not surprising that one of the battlefields for data poisoning is uh, is a spam because this is, I think, one of the of the first domains where machine learning models prove themselves very effective against uh, adversaries. And uh, uh, for the sake of this discussion, let's uh, 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 let's uh, uh, call spam uh, spam providers adversaries. Uh, and what the attackers did, they wanted to uh, uh, to make the model think that their emails uh, are legitimate. So uh, they fed the model with massive amounts of, uh, of uh, spam-like uh, emails, and they labeled all of them uh, as benign. And their intention was, of course, that uh, uh, the model will learn all the, the, the keywords, the structures that are within uh, these messages. Uh, that it will learn that uh, it will learn that uh, these uh, uh, structures and the keywords are actually uh, uh, representing uh, legitimate emails, and when they will have the actual spam, uh, then this, uh, uh, then it will go under the radar uh, uh, of the model. Uh, but uh, uh, Google research team had detected it and, and analyzed, uh, and this is, uh, and, and uh, this um, uh, th th this chart uh, came from uh, uh, Google research. Uh, another example, again, uh, of uh, of spam filters is um, an availability attack. So if the previous attack, you can think of it as sort of a backdoor because the attackers wanted to, to have backdoors within the model that will allow them to do something later. So this was in, is an availability attack. The victim here is, uh, actually this is not an attack, this, this is a research on, on a potential attack. Uh, the victim here is a spam-based uh, spam filter. And the idea was to pollute the, the spam dictionary with legitimate words because they knew that this, uh, this is an open source uh, spam. A spam filter, they knew that it works, uh, that it is based on uh, keywords, some kind of, of a Bayesian uh, network that is uh, based on detecting keywords that are uh, correlated somehow to spam or to uh, legitimate uh, uh, emails. And they created uh, a large batch of, um, of, uh, uh, of messages that were built from legitimate words, probably very popular uh, words, uh, and they uh, uh, they classified these as uh, spam. And in this case, they wanted to make the, uh, the spam filter detect more legitimate uh, messages as uh, spam. And uh, indeed, on the right side, you can see the, uh, the results. Having uh, one control over 1% of the, of the messages 
uh, was sufficient to make the model classify 80% of, of the total legitimate messages as spam, uh, or to detect, uh, to classify 95% of the total legitimate messages as unsure, uh, both of them make this model practically uh, uh, completely unusable uh, uh, for any, uh, for any uh, usage. So probably like myself at the beginning, you see these examples and you say, okay, so um, we gave the attacker a significant power. We gave him the power to provide us data and to tell us also, also what is the meaning of this data, to do the labeling. So if we only could get rid of, the, uh, of giving the attacker the power to label, then we'll be good, right? Wrong. Uh, because another variant of a data poisoning attack, uh, which is called a clean label attack, uh, actually works when the attacker is response is giving you the data, but he doesn't have any influence about the labeling process. And the way it works, uh, the, the victim here is an image classification system. And uh, what the attacker does, he wants uh, the, uh, this uh, model to classify uh, these images of a fish that you see on the top uh, to classify them as dogs. And the way uh, the attacker achieves that, uh, he takes an image of a dog, and now we add to this image an invisible noise, invisible for, for me, invisible for you, invisible for the trusted person that is responsible for doing the trusted labeling. Uh, so we add this invisible noise to the image. This invisible noise includes patterns that somehow are correlated to, to, the, uh, to the top image of the fish. Uh, and what will happen uh, next, that the trusted uh, labeler will see a dog, will classify this image as a dog, uh, and the model will get this as a dog. And when this model will see uh, this image of a fish, it will classi classify it uh, as a dog. And this uh, attack works with a very, very high uh, uh, success rate. Um, you see in this, uh, in this graph, in, uh, the, the blue side, you see that the confidence of the, of the model when seeing images of uh, fish and classifying them as a dog is more than 95%. Uh, same thing on the bottom when the attacker wants to uh, classify images of dog uh, as fish. Uh, this attack is uh, extremely uh, successful. And the, and the main thing here is that uh, actually this attack works even when the, this uh, service provider actually uh, uh, hire some uh, trusted people to make the, uh, the labeling, uh, but still uh, the attack is uh, effective. So uh, that's, we talked about the threats, so let's uh, talk a, a little bit about the mitigation. Uh, th there are two mitigation approaches which are, well, th they are straightforward. Uh, the first one uh, is let's uh, filter suspicious data. We get a lot of data that we do the training with. Uh, now we can filter uh, uh, data that looks uh, suspicious. Uh, it can be data that's coming from, uh, that maybe the data itself is suspicious. Maybe it comes from suspicious, suspicious origins, maybe IP addresses that we suspect for some reason, uh, suspicious users, suspicious uh, clients. Maybe we can uh, filter out uh, all the data that comes from, uh, from bots, et cetera. Another approach, uh, another mitigation approach is to do the data sampling for the data that is used for the training to make it in a, in, in a fault tolerant way, uh, to try to limit uh, the impact uh, of data points that are arriving from a single entity. Again, entity can be a user, can be IP address, uh, can be things like that. Uh, and again, if you think about uh, booking.com, for example, uh, I think that you, cannot, you can't do rating uh, without having uh, a committed uh, a transaction an actual uh, transaction. Uh, and uh, I'm sure that if you go to, I don't know, to, the, to Amazon and you want to, uh, to give a rating to a particular product, and you know, you, you push a 3,000 uh, 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 five-star uh, rating, uh, rates, uh, rating rates, uh, rates within uh, one minute from uh, the same IP and the same user, then we'll probably you will get blocked. Uh, so again, this is a, 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 a pretty straightforward, not always uh, very easy to carry out because we know that uh, if we see messages from different IPs, then they still can come from the same source, but, uh, uh, but it, it is what it is. Uh, other uh, mitigation approaches, uh, less effective, 
uh, or uh, um, there are detection approaches uh, like uh, diff tracking uh, to keep uh, measuring the distance from uh, a new model from the previous model and assume that if you see that the new model is very, very different from previous model, then, uh, then you uh, can conclude that you are under data poisoning attack. Uh, you can use a reliable benchmark to build a golden data set that uh, you know for sure what should be the result of the model for this data set. And if it makes different uh, uh, um, uh, predictions, then you can conclude that uh, you are under attack. Uh, but, but again, these are, um, when the model comes to, uh, to represent a, a changing a dynamic environment, then uh, these detections are, are less effective because you expect the model uh, to change and you don't know what is the, the right prediction uh, for a golden data set. Uh, and of course, there is a, a security by obscurity. You can uh, assume that the, the attackers don't care about you and you can assume that they don't know exactly how you work. Uh, what is the model? What is your model doing? What is the type of the model? And, uh, and that even if they want to attack, they will not know exactly how to do that. Uh, uh, good luck with that. We are, we are in B science. We know that uh, security by obscurity uh, very rarely proves itself as an effective mitigation against practically uh, anything. So uh, let, let me summarize uh, what we got so far. So uh, data poisoning is a significant threat uh, on learning me mechanisms. Uh, this threat is critical when you use data from untrusted sources. A another uh, important um, uh, condition is that the, the output of the model, the prediction of the model is significant for someone. And I hope for you that every model that you're working with uh, has, uh, uh, make, is making predictions that are significant for someone. Uh, and there is no silver bullet mitigation. There is a collection of, uh, uh, of uh, mitigations that uh, can be used uh, to throttle the attackers, um, uh, but not necessarily to, to, to stop them at once. Uh, again, uh, the, uh, and, and this threat is effective in any place where you have an adversary. So in, uh, every time when you have uh, travel sites, uh, any site that uses rating, definitely cybersecurity uh, services um, are subject because you have adversaries and the, and the data uh, next generation uh, uh, antiviruses, they actually use data that not always they, they, they know where it comes or not always they, uh, they can, uh, can trust it. Uh, so this threat is, uh, is effective in, in many, many cases. Uh, next, I will uh, try to look at the uh, data poisoning threat in the light of um, uh, when it comes to uh, uh, web security. Uh, what you see on the top is uh, a typical web security uh, uh, setup. Uh, there is a web application or API, uh, and there is a WAF web application firewall that protects uh, the, the application from outsider threats, uh, aka uh, the internet. Uh, usually, web application firewalls work by using a combination of two uh, security approaches. Just a second. Uh, there is uh, the negative security model, uh, which assumes that everything is good, all the traffic we see is good, except for things that we know for sure that are bad. Usually when we have a matching, pattern matching with uh, some uh, uh, rule. And, and the other model is a positive security model where, uh, where the WAF assumes that everything is bad for what he you knows for sure uh, is good, usually based on uh, looking at, uh, at the traffic for some time and uh, learning what are, uh, building a baseline profile uh, for how this traffic uh, looks like and uh, block uh, or alert uh, on a deviation from this profile. Uh, this is uh, practically what we call uh, a anomaly detection. And uh, the difference, uh, each of these models have uh, uh, pros and cons. Uh, the negative security model is, uh, is more accurate, it's false positives, but it uh, requires ongoing update because it is not effective against uh, zero days. Uh, but the main uh, important thing for the sake of, of our discussion today is that uh, when I'm when I'm saying that uh, uh, the positive security model means that the WAF learns a baseline profile from traffic, then you should now know that we have all the ingredients of a data poisoning uh, threat uh, being uh, uh, fulfilled, being realized. 
because data comes from outside, and of course, uh, attackers want uh, to make the WAF uh, uh, make mistakes. So uh, no doubt that uh, this is a, a situation is a is a good uh, place for uh, data poisoning. Uh, so uh, again, for the sake of uh, this discussion, uh, let's assume that uh, the web or API traffic profile looks essentially like that. Uh, you have objects, which are the, the red uh, uh, items here. You can think of them as parameters, uh, query string parameters, body parameters. You can also think of, of a cookie as a sort of uh, a parameter. Uh, each parameter, uh, each object is uh, contained in, uh, in a container, which can be uh, a URL. Uh, URL end method, maybe host end URL, uh, or global parameter can be different uh, combinations of uh, host URL and, and method. Uh, and each one of them has uh, a traffic profile, uh, which is uh, the representation of all the values that are permissible to go through uh, this, um, uh, this uh, object, through this uh, uh, parameter. And the features of this profile, usually it makes sense to use features that have some web security meaning uh, because they are somehow correlated to the way uh, we understand the web attacks. So it makes sense to learn the type of the parameter, uh, the multiplicity, whether it can come only once or multiple times within a single request, uh, optional or mandatory. Uh, if it is a number, then what are the typical sizes? Uh, if it is a string, then what is the length of uh, uh, the, the potential length uh, uh, range of this uh, uh, of the value? Uh, and what are the uh, the permissible characters for this uh, uh, parameter? All of these are things that uh, can be uh, correlated with uh, different uh, uh, web attacks, and it makes sense to uh, to, uh, to learn them. Uh, and in order to do uh, 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 the, the learning in a robust manner. Um, again, th th this is a, a typical way to uh, to uh, achieve that. Uh, so the first uh, phase to do uh, cleaning, which is the uh, first mitigation, uh, to filter all the suspicious traffic that uh, you can think of. So if you have events, uh, uh, requests that you were classified by some uh, engine as uh, suspicious or malicious, then you can throw them away. If you have a request from IPs that you have some reason to think that they are suspicious or malicious, then again, you can, uh, everything is good? Okay. Um, if you know that these IPs uh, generate uh, malicious traffic, then again, uh, you can also, when you have an attack on a site, you can take all the batch of the request during this attack and throw them away because you, you can assume that some of the attack uh, was missed and uh, and you can, in some cases, it makes sense also to throw away data coming from uh, from bots. Uh, then uh, the second um, uh, filtering is to try to do this, um, um, uh, this uh, 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 threshold uh, learning uh, to learn things only if you see them coming, not from a single uh, entity, but maybe from a collection of uh, different IP addresses uh, or, or other network domains, uh, different user agents, different uh, geolocation countries, uh, different identified clients. Uh, and even if you want to prevent yourself to, to avoid learning from, from a burst of uh, requests coming at the same time, then you can, uh, uh, can require that you learn things only when you see them along several days or at least several hours. And again, you can uh, play with the different uh, attributes and put a, a threshold that, that, that makes sense for your uh, application uh, on uh, uh, any of these. Uh, now, however, this threshold learning is, is very easy to, uh, to carry out in, in uh, batch processing. Uh, however, if you want to do batch processing, you, you need now to, to buffer all the data that you've seen along the uh, the learning period, it can be a day, it can be a week, it can be a month, depending on uh, what exactly, you, uh, how you set uh, the learning period, which in many cases will be uh, impractical or at least very expensive. Uh, and there is a need to, to, to find a way to do this in, uh, in a more uh, memory efficient uh, way. Uh, and, and at least in, in Imperva, we try to do everything we can in a streaming, fa in a streaming friendly fashion, uh, in a way that uh, we don't have to keep, to, to, to keep 
huge buffers that keep all uh, all the data that we can do uh, uh, use the more uh, efficient uh, structures. Uh, in order in order to uh, present the string friendly uh, uh, solution that we developed for uh, uh, for uh, robust learning, I will take you to a completely different uh, world. Uh, uh, this this is by the way a completely uh, a fictitious uh, uh, story. Uh, this is not a, a it's not a, re a really research that we carried out, important to say that. Uh, in fact, uh, I don't have a dog, I have a, a cat, so I have no, uh, uh, I'm not biased uh, towards uh, any uh, uh, dog food uh, brand. Uh, so we want to uh, to do some kind of uh, competition between two uh, dog food uh, brands, Pedigree and uh, Tio. So we do sort of, uh, of a poll uh, between different users. And uh, we got, uh, you see in the, uh, in, uh, in the a yellow text, you can see the results. And we got uh, 12 uh, likes for a Tio brand and six likes uh, for, for a Pedigree brand. Uh, however, we are afraid of uh, data poisoning. Uh, we don't want to give too much uh, power to a single brand or a single uh, uh, city. Uh, and then we set the threshold of uh, at least uh, three cities and at least uh, three uh, dog breeds in order to uh, to accept the fact that a TO is a tasteful, um, is a tasty uh, food. Uh, and when we do this threshold learning, then only pedigree, which had the six likes, uh, passes. And the reason for that, as you can see here, that uh, for TO, uh, there, there is no uh, San Bernard that they gave him uh, a positive uh, tastiness indication, only Pomeranian and uh, German Shepherd. Uh, however, for uh, pedigree, uh, we have uh, quite balanced uh, uh, voting. We have uh, uh, two votes from three cities and uh, three uh, uh, dog breeds, and then we're good. And the reason for this, uh, for this uh, sort of anomaly uh, for this phenomenon is that uh, the, the data that we have, you can see that all the uh, New Yorkers that have Pomeranian, they really they like Theo. And there are uh, quite many of these because our data is biased towards uh, New Yorkers that have uh, Pom Pomeranians. Uh, and this is exactly the thing that we wanted to avoid. We didn't want to, to let uh, this bias in our data uh, to impact uh, our decision. So uh, how do we uh, do the learning uh, on this data? So uh, first we have uh, a pedigree is an object. Uh, this object, there is a fact that we want to learn, uh, whether pedigree is tasty or not. And we define the threshold learning, which is on uh, two attributes, uh, CT and breed. For each one, we put a threshold of uh, three. And for each one of these, we actually uh, maintain, we keep a, a set of all the cities from which we've seen a tastiness indication for a pedigree. And we have the same structure for a TO and the same for other facts like whether this uh, dog food brand is uh, nutritious. Uh, and at the beginning, we see no data, so we are convinced at nothing. We don't believe at anything. We wait for data to start being convinced. Data coming in, and now looking at the data, we see that uh, pedigree tastiness now have um, uh, tastiness indications from three cities and from three dog breeds. And now we know that we're good uh, we passed the city threshold, we passed the breed threshold, and therefore we now accept that pedigree is tasty. On the other hand, uh, for Tio, we have only uh, two cities and only two uh, dog breeds, and therefore it didn't pass any of the tests, and we don't believe that uh, Tio is tasty. So uh, what we learned in this uh, uh, thing, in, li in this example, that we can learn a Boolean facts whether an object uh, X, in this case, this is dog food brand, it has a property Y, uh, which is uh, whether or not it is tasty. This is a Boolean fact. Uh, and uh, you probably understood that, that the memory consumption here is proportional to several, several parameters and to the number of the objects, of course, uh, to the properties or the facts that we want to learn about every object and, and to the number of attributes and also for the thresholds because we need to uh, uh, to keep all the cities from which we've seen uh, these uh, tastiness indications uh, until until we pass the test and then we can throw them away but uh, we can until we pass the test we need to keep them uh, but the thing that we wanted to achieve is that it is independent of the size 
of the uh, of the data itself. Uh, so uh, it makes this uh, algorithm, this implementation of threshold learning, uh, uh, memory efficient and can be used in the streaming uh, uh, situations and environments. Uh, so we have this model of uh, Boolean facts. Uh, how this model can be used in uh, when we want to uh, uh, to build a web uh, profile uh, or API profile and to uh, uh, and to enforce it later. So it, actually, it is fairly quite straightforward. Uh, when we see uh, a data point, uh, a request, then uh, we can extract uh, uh, for a given fact uh, whether fact X was seen within this uh, request. We collect all these uh, fact X uh, seen, uh, and then we try to learn uh, whether uh, this fact X passes all the threshold tests that we, uh, that we have. And if it passes all the thresholds, then uh, we can define it as allowed. And it can be now part of the profile. If it is uh, not allowed, meaning that at least there was one threshold it hadn't passed, then uh, we have a different flag within the profile, which is fact X uh, prohibited. Uh, so uh, think of, uh, of a, a web profile as a collection of uh, fact X allowed and fact X prohibited for different uh, facts. Uh, during the inference, we, uh, when, when you see a new request, you take, uh, you extract all the fact X seen uh, from this uh, request. And, and now you, do, you enforce by uh, looking at fact X seen that, that there is in this request that is corresponding to uh, fact X prohibited. And when uh, you have a match, then you have a contradiction to the profile and you can now uh, declare a violation. Uh, so this is how the enforcement can work and it is pretty straightforward. Uh, so the Boolean fact uh, approach uh, works well with, uh, with the web or API uh, profiles. Uh, but uh, is, is this enough? Meaning we, we can do uh, Boolean facts, but what can you express with Boolean facts? So uh, let's start with the object and uh, containers. Uh, we talked about URL, host, and parameters, cookies. Um, so in fact, these are uh, go, go, goes along pretty easily with uh, Boolean facts because uh, if you want to learn that the particular query string parameter X uh, is uh, uh, belongs to URL Y with uh, method uh, get or post or or, or, or Z, uh, then the nature of this piece of information is is Boolean. Uh, so this is pretty uh, straightforward, and it is the same if uh, which URLs you have and which cookies belong to URL and which methods are available for a particular URL. It it, it goes uh, 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 fairly easily. Uh, however, you want to answer also questions like what about uh, things like a data type, ranges, character sets, etc. Uh, so if we look now on uh, the type of a parameter, then you, you uh, need to do sort of, um, uh, in, in, in data science, it is called one hot encoding. And you divide uh, for each of the, uh, of the categories of the parameter for uh, parameter types, a numeric string, uh, a none, if it is representing no, a non-existent uh, value, uh, or Boolean. Uh, so you have an, a num type allowed flag and a non-num type allowed flag. They are different. Um, and you have also corresponding, uh, the, actually, the, uh, the opposite one. Uh, so you either have a num type allowed for this parameter in the profile or a num type uh, prohibited uh, in the profile. Uh, and you uh, you have one from each uh, uh, from each of uh, uh, these pairs. So how you use them? Uh, suppose you want to have in the profile uh, to express the fact a particular parameter is a string. Uh, then you learn that a string type is allowed for values for this profile, uh, but you not you don't learn uh, you fail to learn that num a numeric type is allowed and therefore you have that numeric type is prohibited. And if you only see strings, then uh, you, you cannot learn that non-STR values are allowed. So you will learn that non-STR types are prohibited. And then when we see uh, x equal 23, then uh, it is prohibited and we have a violation. If you have, uh, if the type is a mail address and you have um, a regular expression that represents mail address, and again, I believe that from the first example, you understand that 
the more important uh, uh, flags are not the, the green ones, but the red ones. So you, if you only see uh, email addresses, then uh, you have in the profile a uh, non-mail regular expression uh, prohibited. Uh, even if you've seen one or two times things that are not compatible with the regular expression, they probably didn't pass the thresholds. And, and then when you see now uh, ABC, for example, in this value of this parameter, uh, which have non-mail regular expression, then it contradicts uh, this uh, uh, non-mail regular expression prohibited uh, uh, flag. And again, you have a violation. Uh, whether it's mandatory or optional, uh, the parameter is mandatory or optional. So it can be addressed with uh, missing prohibited or missing uh, allowed uh, uh, flags. When you want to uh, express the fact that uh, a parameter can or cannot have a, a no value, then do the same with the non type allowed or not and non non type uh, uh, allowed allowed or prohibited. Uh, when you want to express the fact that uh, multiplicity is allowed for a parameter, then again uh, uh, you can do it uh, in, in the same way. You use uh, multiple occurrences allowed or uh, prohibited. Uh, when you want to handle a character set, then again you can build flags that are corresponding with a set with character sets like a base S64 uh, or for particular characters. For example, if you uh, you want to say that um, to express the fact that alphanumeric is okay and the colon and semicolon are okay, but any other special character is forbidden, uh, then you will have a str type allowed, a alphanumeric type allowed, uh, but uh, special characters uh, prohibited for the different special characters, except for the, the ones that, uh, that we've seen. So um, when you want to learn uh, numeric features, uh, then you need to do uh, more uh, sort of a trick to the discretization of the, of the range uh, into uh, several uh, ranges. So uh, if you're uh, in the learning, you, you, you want to learn that, uh, to include in the profile, the fact that the parameter length is between 34 and 345 characters, then you have to define in advance a threshold like 50 and 500 and to learn uh, Boolean flags, uh, Boolean facts like uh, whether the parameter value can be greater than 500 or greater than 50 and greater than 5,000 or lower than 10. And uh, that can help you to, uh, to uh, express uh, this uh, thing. Uh, but I, 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 I don't get deep into the details of how exactly it is done, but I want to convince you that uh, it can be uh, done. Uh, so we talked about, uh, uh, about the profile. Uh, about the features of a profile. Let me uh, try to explain uh, how the Boolean framework, the Boolean fact framework can be used for more complicated models like decision trees. Uh, on the right side, you see a, a very simple uh, decision tree. Uh, this is one of, the, uh, one of the machine learning models that are uh, more uh, popular. And you have their two features, uh, whether a particular animal breathes air and whether an animal lay eggs and each of them is a Boolean. And when you see an animal, then the decision tree says that you go, yes, no, breathe air, uh, lay eggs. And you, uh, in the leaves, you have the, the, the classes, the different decisions, uh, the potential decision. And this is a very simple uh, uh, model. Uh, and usually it is used in a, as something that's called an ensemble, when you have a collection of models uh, that uh, are uh, work uh, together. One type of ensemble, ensemble is bagging, when you build uh, many models independently and then you do some kind of a voting or averaging of the, the prediction of the models. Uh, another approach is uh, called boosting, when you actually, you, you don't build the, the mo different models independently, but you, uh, you build the models in a way that corrects uh, the, uh, uh, the mistakes of uh, the previous, uh, of the previous uh, model. And then you, you have a collection of models that together provide uh, uh, a good, good result. Uh, so how can we use the Boolean framework in, in this uh, situation? Uh, let me first explain uh, what you see here in this decision tree. Uh, so if we look at, uh, uh, at uh, this uh, node, a petal with uh, a smaller equal 1.65, uh, then uh, 48 uh, samples from the training data uh, reach this, uh, uh, this node. Uh, 47 of them had uh, the green uh, class. Uh, one had uh, uh, the purple class, uh, 
uh, and uh, the decision if we should this point is uh, the, the one that has the, uh, the most uh, samples, which is uh, uh, the, the green class, uh, versi color. Uh, so for the for building the tree, uh, the Boolean framework cannot cannot help you, but there are ways to build uh, trees in in a, a streaming uh, uh, manner. Um, uh, but the uh, the Boolean framework can help you uh, to uh, uh, to do validation of the tree, and the way to do that is uh, you can add uh, uh, sub leaves to uh, each of the leaves. Uh, you can also add uh, sub leaves to uh, to the nodes. Uh, and all these uh, uh, subleaves are actually, um, if we have here in, in, in the most uh, left uh, in, uh, leaf, we had uh, only uh, the green class, then we'll have a subleaf uh, for the green class. If we have a node that have uh, two classes, it will have two subleaves representing uh, uh, both of them. And now uh, we go and we use the threshold learning and the Boolean facts to uh, validate uh, these uh, subleaves. Uh, so you can see here, uh, for example, for uh, this uh, node with the 47 and 1, uh, you have 47 uh, data points uh, that were uh, had the green class. So probably let's assume that they passed all the thresholds. However, you had only one uh, data point for, uh, for the purple class, so probably didn't pass the threshold. Uh, so you learn uh, only uh, nodes and uh, and branches and uh, leaves that are uh, passing all these uh, tests. Uh, and now the tree that you're getting is actually a subtree of the original tree. Uh, there is uh, some uh, caveat here that uh, before beforehand we only had one decision per sample. Now we have situations exactly. Uh, for example, uh, if we reach this point. Uh, then we have nothing that is validated, so there is no decision for the model. And if we reach this point, if, for example, the tree was uh, only uh, truncated at, at this area, at this uh, level, and this point has two decisions. So we need to handle uh, this situation, but th th there are many ways uh, uh, to do that. Uh, so this is a way for, uh, to do the validation of uh, the tree. Uh, what can we do when it comes to ensembles? So uh, when it comes to bagging, actually this is straightforward. When we have the uh, models that are uh, set, we can now uh, validate uh, the trees. And uh, in fact, it, it is even easier because the problem that we had of no decision or multiple decisions, uh, when you do an averaging or voting, then you can say, okay, when I have no decision, then I have no vote. When I have uh, two decisions, the permissible decisions, then I give two votes, one for the first class and the second for the second class. Uh, so it uh, actually may uh, make sense. Uh, for uh, boosting uh, uh, ensembles, it, it is uh, less uh, straightforward to use because when I, I say uh, tree validation, this is not exactly validation. Uh, it is beyond that. It is uh, uh, also actually changing the, uh, the tree. And since we have uh, a path of optimizations here, then if you change the tree, then you need to make sure that, um, that it will not impact uh, the rest of, uh, uh, of the chain. So uh, it might be useful also for this area, but uh, uh, I... Uh, it is probably uh, more complicated to, uh, to obtain that. Uh, this is a, a good uh, direction for uh, research, uh, uh, I believe. So uh, let's uh, sum up. Um, data poisoning is a significant threat on learning mechanisms. Uh, it, is, uh, it, it is there whenever you uh, do something meaningful based on data from untrusted so uh, sources with or without a uh, trusted labeling. Uh, Threshold-based learning may provide an adequate, uh, robust learning uh, solution. Uh, the Boolean facts framework that I presented uh, provides a streaming-friendly implementation uh, for threshold-based learning. And uh, many features of uh, when you build a profile uh, can be expressed with Boolean facts, even if it, it seems that uh, a limited model, it is not that limited. Uh, it can be, uh, it can work also for uh, uh, for numeric uh, and for uh, uh, categorized uh, uh, features. And uh, threshold learning of trees and forests is partially possible with Boolean fact. Uh, I showed you how you can, uh, uh, you, you cannot build a tree uh, in this manner, but you can do validation of the tree to make sure that your tree is, uh, is, uh, is uh, fault tolerant. Uh, and that's it. Uh, thank you for listening. And uh, now we have uh, a couple of minutes for uh, questions.
Uh, I can't hear anyone. Okay. okay. Hi. It's Hi. It's Hi. Looks like we had an, like issue, we had with an issue with our, our volunteer, uh, volunteer dropping out, dropping out. Um, and video, um, issues. video issues. So, so I'm going to go ahead and end this broadcast now. Um, um, thank you for thank coming. You for thank, coming. You for thank you for presenting. Um, um, if you can, you make can sure to make stick sure around in the track one breakout session in Discord. Look for questions from our attendees. But beyond that, that's pretty much it. Um, we do have a question, have coming, a question in, coming in, which is which interesting, interesting information. information. <laughs> so more of a so statement more of a again. Statement again. Um, so, um, so uh, please, uh, please um, uh, go ahead and, and jump into the Discord room, and I'll go ahead and close this session out. Okay, so I'm in a track one breakout. Yes. Okay, awesome. Hi there, I'm Alyssa Miller, and I'm a hacker. I'm also a security researcher and an advocate for hacking is not a crime. And I'd like to share with you what being a hacker means to me. Because you see, since I was a young, young child, I've always been a hacker. I was the kid that liked to take my toys apart to figure out how they worked and to see if I could make them work better. When I turned 12 years old, I got a job. I saved up enough money and I bought myself my own computer. And on that computer, I wiped it clean, started from scratch, figured out how to build it from the ground up, learned programming so that I could write my own software to run on my computer. I learned modem communications and serial communications so that I could figure out how these online services that I like to use were working. And so when I got into my career, I took a lot of different twists and turns. I started off as a penetration tester. I moved into consulting. I worked at high executive levels, building massive application security programs across large enterprise organizations. I worked for product companies and resellers. But through it all, the one thing that stuck with me was this identity of being a hacker. 
Now, we hear the word hacker thrown about in the media, and it's usually connected with some type of criminal activity. But being a hacker does not mean being a criminal. Being a hacker is all about this innate curiosity, this passion to understand how things work and to see how we can make them work differently, better, create new things. I'm reminded of a quote from a keynote given by Jason Street, one of my colleagues, in which he said, hackers are inventors and creators, not criminals and freaks. And that's the reality. Hackers are people who want to make technology better. We want to make it do cool new things. We want to understand how it works so that we can innovate, we can make things better, and we can make our lives all the more exciting through technology. So I hope you'll join with me and with Hacking is Not a Crime to spread the message that hacking and being a hacker is not a crime. We're not criminals. We're artists and inventors. Thank you so much.